very, very much indeed for coming. Um, I'm delighted to be chairing this meeting at the Royal Society and to tell you more about One Young World. Uh, after more than 20 years as a producer at the BBC, I'm the founder now of the opinion research company YouGov Stone, and I'm honoured and delighted to be a councillor for One Young World. But with me are the two founders of One Young World, David Jones, who is the Global Chief Executive of HAPAS Worldwide and Euro RSCG Worldwide, and Kate Robertson, who is the UK Group Chairman. Give them a hand of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. I'm also very pleased to say that we're joining us online our colleagues and news reporters from all over the world, from countries including Indonesia, Australia, China, India, the Netherlands, Spain, Abu Dhabi, Greece and Poland. We'll also be hearing about one of our newest councillors and on a live link from Dublin in Ireland we'll be joined by one of the delegate sponsors and also in the audience we have one of our young delegates. So there's a lot to hear about. Afterwards of course there'll be a question and answer session both from you in the audience and to our colleagues around the world. And for those who would like to speak to Kate or David afterwards, they also will be staying on a little later afterwards. We'll finish at 12.30 latest, and um, I hope that you're going to enjoy hearing more about this. For the press, there is the One Young World digital press kit, which is on oneyoungworldpresskit.com. That's all I need to tell you, so let's go straight away to the man that can tell you more about what Young World is all about. Over to David Jones. Good morning, um, and thank you to everyone for coming. Now, we're going to try a couple of things today which you're never, ever supposed to do in uh, press conferences, which is live digital link-in. So if they don't work, we weren't intending to do them. Uh, <laughs> but, but hopefully the technology will work. Um, I, I'm really excited to talk to you about One Young World. Uh, the first uh, time I actually talked about this was with Kofi Annan at Davos, uh, when it was really just an idea in, in its infancy. And I, I guess it was probably very appropriate uh, time to talk about it and a place to talk about it because our intention really is to create the, the Davos for 25 year olds or 25 and younger. And I think the, the kind of background to where all of this comes from um, comes out of, of sort of two personal passions uh, of mine and ours and I guess probably two personal passions of the world which are creativity and youth. And Kate and I work in the advertising and communications business, and I think what our business um, has always been very good at is using creativity to change people's behavior. Um, but if you look at some of the, the kind of issues facing the planet today, um, you know, I think we have not only an opportunity, but an obligation to use that ability to actually, and, and use our creativity to change people's behavior around some of the big issues facing the world. And so that was the first pillar in why we created One Young World. Um, and the second one really is youth. Now, I think the world's always been obsessed with youth uh, for a bunch of reasons, many of them good, some of them not so good. But I think that the thing that is very interesting about this generation of young people compared to any generation before is it is dramatically different in that the digital technology and the internet has, has, has done two things. Firstly, young people in the world today have access to information and knowledge like no other generation ever has. So knowledge used to be about accumulation of time and hours spent and access to education, whereas now if you want to sit on your computer and you're in the middle of Kenya, you can download and get access to, to tons and tons of information. So young people today are empowered and knowledgeable in a way that they never were before. And the second thing that digital technology has done is it's given them an ability to actually change behavior, to have a voice, and through social media and, and social networks, to really have an impact and an influence that no previous generation of young people has ever had. So um, that was kind of the, the, the second um, kind of uh, key obsession of ours around youth. And what we, we sat down and thought, if you bring these two things together, um, creativity and youth, what we can actually do is create one young world. And the, the goal of it is really simple. Uh, we want to be the Davos for 25-year-olds, what we want to do is, it's a giant exercise in collaborative creativity, a global exercise in cr collaborative creativity to allow young people and the, the future generation of leaders in the world to actually shape the future and have a voice today. So that's really the kind of the background to, to what we're doing. Um, and I think you know, the timing for it is probably uh, very apt, is that pre um, the recession and the financial meltdown, the world was starting to get much more socially responsible. 
Uh, and I think post uh, the, the recession and financial meltdown, um, you know, it, it, will, it will go from being a sort of a medium-sized trend to, for me, the biggest trend that we'll see hitting business and, and the world over the next 10 years. And one of the reasons for that is that consumers today now expect companies and businesses to actually give back as much as they're taking. Um, we did a, a big global study at the, at the start of last year, um, and basically 86% of people uh, agreed with the statement it's important that companies stand for something other than profitability. Now, this was February last year. I'm actually convinced if we did it now, with everything that's been going on in the world economy, it would be 96 or 100% of people. And I think the, the key uh, thing today, and I talked a little bit about digital technology, is that... Um, you know, the digitally empowered consumer will punish those companies that don't. And I think we've seen you know, numerous examples of this. But, you know, most revolutions give power to the people. The digital revolution has given power to people, and in particular, to young people. And I think the, you know, this is just the front cover of, of Time magazine from a couple of years ago. And it was, a, it was a nice little stunt naming you the person of the year, because, as I said, you control the information age. But it's absolutely true, and it's more, even more true uh, about young people. Um, you know, another stat from our survey, 80% of people say that as a consumer I have the responsibility to censure unethical companies by avoiding their products. And Walmart, I think, is a very interesting example of this. You know, 10 years ago the McKinsey study showed that 8% of people were no longer shopping at Walmart because of, of their views on Walmart's behaviour. Walmart today are probably one of the most progressive and the most advanced companies in the whole area of, of socially responsible business. Um, so on the one hand, you've got consumers who are pushing uh, you know, business to be socially responsible, so socially responsible. On the other hand, you've got um, businesses who are looking at how they should be doing it, what they should be getting involved in. And this is my very own patented Venn diagram. But it, it, you know, there are, on the one side, the real issues that, that consumers care about. And on the other side, there is, from a brand and a business perspective, you know, what is a genuine and credible role for, for a brand or for a business? And I guess the intersection of those uh, two circles is firstly the reason why we got into this, is we decided to, to, find, to find something which we believe was, you know, at the, at the, the cross-section of what are issues that consumers care about and what's a genuine role for us as our business. But on a much bigger scale, what we want to do is, you know, say to the world's companies and the world's businesses, get involved in this, become a sponsor, send delegates. So, very simply, you know, One Young World we've created with the goal of harnessing the power of youth to make the world a better place. Let's have the young people in the world, the next generation of leaders, actually shape the future. And if the world's leaders today can't make the right decisions, well, you know, given how everyone is obsessed with youth, if they hear that the world's youth believe that we should be doing this on climate or that on poverty or this on health, then we think we'll be able to have a real impact. Um, the inaugural summit is taking place in February next year. Uh, February the 8th to 10th. Um, it will involve 1,500 people. Uh, it's the first time that a, a gathering like this will be proportionally representative of the world. So it's not going to be 1,300 people from America to, and 200 from the UK. There's going to be 300 from China and 100 from India. And we're basically recruiting in line with the world's population. Um, we're going to debate uh, around, and, and Kate will talk in a second, about the research that we're in field with at the moment. But what we're doing is we're identifying through talking to young people, what are the big issues that they are concerned about today and that they care about, and then we will have plenary sessions that debate each one of those and pass a resolution on them. Um, just uh, you know, on the slide are some of the very prestigious and esteemed councillors we already have on board. So Desmond Tutu, Kofi Annan, Bob Geldof, Nicholas Haysom, Elia Leone Shetty, he's the global CEO of EMI. Um, and what I thought I, we'd do is just share with you a, a, a couple of videos of some of the councillors talking about why they're involved and what they're hoping to get out of it and what their particular focus is. So if we can run the first one of those. Hello, you remarkable global leaders, young leaders. You are a fantastic group of young people and here is an oldie speaking to you, saying, we want to see this world a different kind of world. We want to see it as a peaceful world, a more compassionate world, a caring world. And so 
we appeal to you. Please send the best that you have, who will be the next generation of leaders. Now, part of um, the success is going to depend not on what the resolutions passed are in, in, in One Young World, but actually the impact that they then have uh, on the broader world. So Bob Geldof has basically committed to raising the resolutions at the G2, the G8, and the G20. Nick Hasem, um, the head of politics at the United Nations, is going to raise uh, the issues across the UN bodies. Kofi Annan, um, who we're working with on his Global Alliance for Climate Justice, is going to use the resolution on climate to comment on what happens in Copenhagen in December. And I, again, I think it would be worth hearing a couple of words from Bob and Kofi. The trouble is that um, we're not sure what the spirit of the age is anymore, that the um, old lines upon which we established ourselves, those of my generation, maybe yours, have proved to be wrong. They've dissolved, but that's the fate of every generation. In the 21st century, we need to anticipate zeitgeist rather than live within them. And uh, this idea, this one young world idea, is cool enough. Your job in this sort of decent idea is to find those ones, the ones you think are very cool, something going on, something that's a bit different about these um, children, and uh, put them in this room so you have uh, this great sort of intellectual capacity being contained in one space and being listened to uh, for a change. I mean, those of us who are conducting the workshops and seminars um, will probably find our own thinking dislodged. And I love that. I love reading polemic that makes me uncomfortable with the way I'm thinking because, frankly, the way I'm thinking just simply isn't right. If it was right, then the world wouldn't be the way it is. And uh, the world will always be the way it is, whatever that may be, for good or ill. But surely there's some way we can get ahead of the game and plot the way we would like it to be, rather than reacting to the events that happen to us in the middle of a zeitgeist. I hope that young people everywhere and the delegates of one young world those who will inherit this planet will join us as partners in the Global Alliance for Climate Justice. So the whole idea behind this is it's, a, it's really an open source collaboration. So what we basically want is that anybody who is involved in youth at any level use this as a vehicle for them. So it's not that this is in competition with another youth initiative and another one. I think this is basically a media vehicle for anybody who's involved in youth to actually get behind it and come on board. Um, obviously, one of the key things behind it is going to be the whole social media side of things. Um, and you'll be hearing a little bit later from Lucien from Brave New Talent. And, and Lucien is, A, one of our first delegates signed up to One Young World. But uh, on the back of that has actually become the person leading the whole social media side of things. And I'll, I'll leave him to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing uh, on that. And then the other you know, key thing I'm excited about today is you know, some of the partners uh, that we already have on board. So here is just a list of some of the people who've signed up as sponsors and to send delegates. And I think what's great about it is it's a terrific cross-section of businesses from different sectors, of, from different parts of the world, which is exactly what we want. Um, and I guess that the final thing before I hand back to Carol that I just wanted to say we're incredibly excited about and to announce today is the partnership with YouTube. So YouTube basically have created a channel for us. Um, what we're going to be doing on that is inviting people, candidates, potential candidates, to submit a video explaining why they should be a candidate uh, to attend One Young World. What we will do is we will take the top 100 uh, videos as voted by YouTube viewers, um, and we will select 20 of them to actually attend uh, One Young World. But I think it's just a, an exciting... Uh, Exciting contest and exciting voter support from YouTube. So I'll now hand you back to Carol. Thank you very much indeed, David. That's a very clear picture as to what we've got so far. Now to hear about some of the latest research that's been carried out for one year. Over to Kate Robertson. Thank you, Carol. Um, checking on. Okay. Um, this is research that is being conducted for us worldwide and analysed by YouGov Stone. So I think that's an important point for those of you here from the media, because this is not research that is being conducted by Havas or Euro RSCG. It is proper third-party polling. 
So polling done all over the world, and we call this the global consultation process, because what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to research the age group and, and really, um, in, in the spirit of One Young World, we're trying to listen to what these people have to say. So phase two is 22 countries, I'll take you through those in a moment. Over 9,000 respondents, which anyone who's engaged in research knows is a big number, it's a lot, of 22 to 29 year olds. Now, um, just looking at the countries, so seven of those in Western Europe, Japan and obviously the big ones, China and India, two in Eastern Europe but includes Russia, Latin America, unfortunately in this survey we only polled Mexico, Australia, then in the Middle East, the UAE, Jordan, Syria, Saudi, and North Africa, Morocco, and Egypt. Now, for the purposes of the charts, I'm going to show you just quickly. We are using, um, and I, I went through this with some of the journalists who phoned in earlier, we're using United Nations definitions here of advanced nations, newly industrialized nations, and then the Middle East and North Africa are, are separated. So that's just to give you a, a run through when I show you the other charts. Um, we asked respondents to rank in importance the issues facing the world from number one to number eight, so number one being the most important. So what you see there is across all three of those groupings, world poverty is absolutely the biggest issue the world faces, and I think Make Poverty History and those types of movement have made that clear. But there is also no doubt that population growth, spread of disease, the environment, economic stability and the absence or, or, or presence of social justice all contribute to world poverty itself. And then of course you have the war on terror and religious intolerance. So those are the top eight. Now grouping those into five areas for discussion, and these will be the five areas of the plenary sessions and the draft and One Young World resolutions for the inaugural summit. I'm moving quickly to politics for a positive future is the way we've framed the responses that we've had. And here you have, to the statement, I think it's crucial to keep up with the news every day, an interestingly high percentage in the Middle East and North Africa strongly agreeing that it's crucial. And then again, to the statement, complete freedom of speech is essential to a successful society among the age group, a very, very high percentage strongly agreeing with that statement in the Middle East and North Africa. And I would suggest to you that that was not an obvious finding or an obvious conclusion. Now, it may be that the differences between that area and the advanced nations say that in advanced nations maybe our young people take this freedom a little bit for granted. The truth is we don't know from this polling, but just the same, it's an interesting stat from the Middle East. Politicians in my country are generally corrupt. This is not a statement that can be polled in Middle East and North Africa, but just the same, um, more than half in newly industrialized nations, and remember please that those include um, China and India, so very important. Corruption, I think, for Western Europe, it's something, a statement we kind of know. Um, in the age group, I trust the world's political leaders. We think, we are not certain, we think that this is an historic low in the advanced and industrialized nations. However, there is a consensus in Western media that says that this lack of trust in political leaders leads to total apathy regarding politics in the age group. You have politicians in my country do not represent the concerns of people my age. Again, I suggest this is empirical knowledge. It is stronger in advanced and newly industrialized. However, to the statement I would be interested in standing for elections in national politics, you have 18% in the advanced nations agreeing and strongly agreeing, and then it gets bigger for newly industrialized bigger in the Middle East and in North Africa. Now this almost replicates findings in the United States 24 months ago. And we would suggest to you here that this is not about apathy. There is a readiness to engage, but the point is what am I engaging with? Now we know from some of the amazing work we've been doing, particularly with people in Latin America, and I hope you get to talk to one of them shortly, for example, the independents, independientes in, in red in Chile, um, Cristina Bitar's movement, which is a political movement of young people that is not a political party, has over 40,000 members. 
So young people saying, yes, I'm signing up, I'm engaged in politics, yeah, but I just don't like the current consensus. Everything, I guess, the US election showed us last year. Now, on the topic of multinational business, and here we will be talking about and debating at One Young World, the role of global business in the world. So, to the statement that these businesses could never be ethical, it is very interesting to see those large yellow bands in the middle, which show that there's an openness to be swayed either way. Strongly agree, disagree, roughly evenly balanced in all of those, in, in those three sectors. Global corporations, too much power. Now, that's an interesting one because we know ourselves we are a global business. That, 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 that's a subjective statement. What constitutes too much power? So if it's an issue of perception, we always say in our business, perception is all. There is definitely a perception there that global corporations have too much power. However, how do they use that power? This age group sees, and once again I would stress, a survey of over 9,000 is a big number. Global business provides jobs in developing nations which helps relieve world poverty. There is a reasonably high, strongly and agree and agree to that statement. So this is a call from this age group to anybody in a global business, yeah? Never mind about the perception that you wield too much power. This age group says, we believe you guys can do something about something we see as the biggest issue. This is a clarion call to global businesses and a very, very important one. On the environment, again, I would suggest that these numbers are empirical. I see climate change affecting me seriously in my lifetime. Extremely high, strongly agree. Extremely high, agree. This is Kofi Annan's plea. This age group know what climate change means. They absolutely know. I don't want to be negative and talk about the fear embodied in that statement. I'm sure it's clear to all of you. However, I would point out, and this goes against the current um, perceived, in inverted commas, wisdom, particularly in some Western media, look at the figure for strongly agree in newly industrialized and agree, but particularly strongly agree, as well as Middle East, North Africa, but realizing newly industrialized, that dark green and the emerald green next to it, that includes the young people of China and India. So any politician looking at global climate change, any media, and saying, well, hey, we don't really have to move or do anything because, you know, China and India aren't go going to do anything. That may be the case looking towards Copenhagen, but it is not the case of the young people who will be running the world in 10, 15, and 20 years' time. They will do something. This is truly a one-world issue. And then just very briefly... To war must but not be carried, never be carried out in the name of religion. Incredibly high scores on strongly agree and agree, which you might say is obvious, but we know there are trouble spots in the world where people do make war, as CNN puts it, in the name of God. This age group say this should never, 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 never be. Okay, so that's just a brief taste of that global consultation process. What I do want to announce today, which is news, and ask all of you, please, all of the media, all of the people attending the conference, calling out to everybody from all over the world online. The global consultation phase, phase three, the process phase three, launches today online on the One Young World website. So this is the call to move to phase three. I would also like to announce that phase three includes, in response to ad hoc responses to phase two, where youngsters have raised a lot of issues around global health, phase three includes a section on global health. So I'd ask all of you please to ensure that everybody you know that is in that age group get online, get into the global consultation process. This is people like the councillors, people like me and David and Carol, people who run global businesses saying, yes, we are listening. Please talk to us. This is enough from me. Thank you very, very much indeed, Kate.
I'm waiting for technical advice as to who we can go to next. But I can tell you now, we're going to go to one of the delegates we're lucky enough to have here, and he'll be introduced by David. Um, yeah, I think I, I mentioned to you as I was talking that we have not only uh, someone who is one of the first delegates to One Young World, but also the person running the whole social media side of things, who is Lucian, who is also the head of, of Brave New Talent. So Lucian, if you want to come up on uh, to the podium and explain a little bit about A, what you're doing on the social media side of things, and B, why you were excited about becoming a delegate. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here, a real honor. Um, I, I suppose being uh, the only delegate to speak, there should be 1,500 up here speaking, but... Um, it's your last chance. <laughs> Um, I, first, uh, I first got introduced to Kate, uh, I think it was back in November, and heard about One Young World and was instantly attracted to it. I thought it was an amazing concept. And uh, something that I hadn't heard of uh, any kind of global corporation doing anything like this. Um, so it really kind of floats my boat. So because um, I, I kind of came with the, uh, with the view that it was never so important that uh, my generation were a generation of leaders. And anything I can do to shape that was, was all for the better. So I'm just going to start with what we, how we got involved to begin with. Was, um, I, uh, I started saying to Kate that social media was, was a hugely powerful way to attract these young leaders because it's quite an ambitious campaign to go out and get 1,500 people. And social media, what you would get is people putting themselves forward, a real grassroots approach where people would be representing both their country and their generation by putting themselves forward. Um, so we figured 1,500 people, 192 countries, that's a massive challenge. So we wanted to split it up, and that's where we got this proportionate representation. So we said, right, if you take two people from every country in the world and then cut up the population as it's cut up in real life, what you get is the first time ever in history that uh, countries like China and India have been pre uh, represented according to their population. It's probably quite also the case the first time in history that countries like the UK and the States have actually had proportionate representation rather than disproportionate representation. So anyway, I started getting involved and um, with Brave New Talent, I'm CEO of Brave New Talent, which we've got a social networking platform. So we, start, we built a, a Facebook app and started pushing that. We started using Twitter. Uh, we've, um, we've had videos on YouTube, all the, all the kind of in things. Um, we've also been getting together a network of other partners that can help us push this out. That's included Wayne, the world's largest travel social network, that uh, were very kind enough to email uh, their, their members, 12 million members, about One Young World. Um, and I can announce today that we've just confirmed a partnership with the world's largest student uh, leadership organization, ISIC, uh, that are going to help us, ISIC Global, are going to help us push this out to their entire, entire network base of 80,000 students. So why, to me, go, moving on, um, why is One Young World important? What's the point, basically? Because I think a lot of people ask that. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a huge initiative to bring all these people from all over the world to one place. Um, could that money be better spent? Is, it just, is the whole thing just a waste of time? I really think not. I think when you look around at the way money is wasted, One Young World is this awesome initiative to, to really have an impact. Um, one thing's for sure is that w the world is currently, we are in crisis. I think we're all agreed on that. Um, there's so many challenges ahead that we've got we've to start responding to. Um, we certainly live in ex times of exponential change, whether that be technology, whether it be the way we work, or the way we communicate with social media. Um, but I think the picture is not all pretty in that, um, in that you know, the growing gap between rich and poor, the, the, the way the climate is uh, heating up, uh, icebergs are melting, um, or whether it's the growing religious, in, r religious um, fundamentalism. My, my view is that our, my, my, my generation's children will look back on these years as the worst years in all human history. I think we've all got a responsibility to that. So what is then the point of, of One Young World? If we, can, if we can identify a generation of leaders now, a generation early, basically, and give them the tools and the means to empower them to have a voice. Uh, that, for me, is what One Young World is. To give them a platform from which they can really implement the change that they want to see. Um, I see these people, they could be, you know, just imagine if one, two, five percent of the room are uh, young future Obamas. Imagine the impact that they could have by getting going now, rather than waiting until they're the right age to be a leader. So, why I'm doing it. I've had a huge amount of uh, op opportunity growing up. I've lived a, a life of, of, of real, um, you know, I'm hugely lucky. Good for 
Um, but I've also grown up with um, visiting India from a young age, and I've always known how lucky I am. And I think, for me, it's all, it's all a, about the responsibility I have to give the uh, biggest impact to those around me, the biggest positive impact. And I see One Young World as exactly that. Now, um, I've also seen unbelievable opportunities since I got involved with One Young World. Um, I said yes, I jumped in at the deep end. I said to Kate, how can I help? Um, Kate then invited me to Davos. I got to speak, at 25, I got to speak to existing world leaders like Bill Gates, uh, Melinda Gates, uh, Mohammed Yunus, things that 25-year-olds just should not do. Uh, I think One Young World is that platform with which young people can really stand up and say, I do care and I want, I want this to happen. So I think we live in a world full of complacency and it really frustrates me. I think what we need to do is get the young people that aren't complacent, that really want to make a change, and empower them to make that difference. And we really need the help of everyone in this room, and a lot more, uh, to make One Young World happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucian. Well, I was at the TED conference last week, never been to Dallas, and uh, two of the delegates for One World that I met there too, uh, one from uh, Dubai and one from Kenya, and it really, as Lucian said, it really is quite uplifting to know what they're doing at that age and what maybe one young world can help them do. But now we can talk to one, our newest councillor, and I'm going to go over to David to introduce him. Um, yeah, we talked to you about some of the, the fantastic councillors we have, Kofi Annan, Bob Geldof, Desmond Tutu. Um, the person I'm now going to introduce to you uh, is probably one of the most impressive people I've ever met. Um, his name is Oscar Morales. Um, <laughs> Oscar basically, I think it sounds like he's just appeared behind me. Uh, Oscar basically um, <coughs> comes from Colombia, was uh, kind of sick of, uh, as many people in that country, of the, the violence and kidnapping that was happening uh, with the FARC. And he basically, uh, through a Facebook account, created a movement called One Million uh, Voices. And One Million Voices led to 12 million people in 200, and city, 200 cities and 60 countries around the world marching against the FARC, and it's the biggest uh, human march against terrorism ever in the history of the world, and it was organised by Oscar um, using a Facebook account. Now, Oscar's very old now, he's about 34, so we, <laughs> we said to him he's not actually allowed to attend as a delegate. He's, he's exactly the kind of person we would have wanted as a delegate um, you know, had he been 25 or under, but I think what he is is a phenomenal example of the power of, of, of young leadership, um, and so he's going to be one of our councillors. So, and it's also about 5:45 in uh, in Bogota. So, thank you for joining us. How are you doing, Oscar? Well, hello to everyone. It's, uh, first of all, it's an honor to 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 be with you this morning. Uh, it's very early morning in Colombia right now. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, as I tell you, uh, when I first knew about One Young World, I felt so excited that this initiative is happening right now in a, in a world like ours. Uh, it's very important that, that young people can commit to make a real change. And, and if, if for something, uh, our experience in Colombia, uh, the, the things that we have achieved uh, about mobilizing that many people against terrorism can do, uh, an example to, 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 to inspire other delegates to, to commit to good causes. So count on me. I'm really, really very excited to be part of, of this initiative to give up one young world. Thank you, Oscar. And you wrote a, you, you wrote a, a fantastic email uh, about the things you're trying to do in Latin America and, uh, and the organizations you're pulling together and how you think one young world can can be a voice for that. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, last, last week I was in Caracas, Venezuela. Is, uh, Venezuela is next to Colombia, in, is, is in the corner, in the, in the first corner of South America. And we were discussing the possibility to build a Latin American youth network. Uh, we are so convinced that young people are the ones who have to make changes in the world. Uh, we cannot longer stay indifferent from the things that are happening to us, especially in countries like ours that are in the process of development and there are some threats uh, that are jeopardizing our security and our democracies. So young people are the ones who, who are willing to, 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 to take a stand uh, and be an example to elders in order to take actions to, 
correct democracy, to uh, guarantee liberty, to guarantee securities, uh, Latin American countries are very, very threatened by, 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 by all these things. So, uh, when I when I first learned about about, about the Colombian world, I, I was really convinced that this is a very, very good method to involve the participation. Uh, I mean, to embrace the participation of the youth, of the young people, and to embrace this power. Young people are really powerful in the world, like 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 the one the one we are living in. Thank you, Oscar. Well, listen, I really appreciate you joining us um, so early in the morning, and we're absolutely delighted and honoured to have you as a councillor, so thank you very much. Well, uh, it's an honour to tell you, and, and I hope we, we, will, we look forward to seeing you London next February 2010. Thank you. Thanks, Oscar. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. Good. Thank okay, you. then we, I now have to fill 20 seconds before we get our next person online from Skype, I think it is. So, David, do you want to say any more about uh, Oscar, Oscar or about another no, councillor? No, I think it, what's interesting um, was my experience of meeting Oscar. I was at uh, a dinner organised by Google Site Guys, and I was sitting um, between Oscar on my left and then Jared Cohen on my right. And Jared is 26 or 27. He's basically the, ha the head of counter-espionage, counter-terrorism in Hillary Clinton's office. Um, he traveled around the Middle East living in and within the terrorist organizations and wrote a book about that. And he was the person uh, in the, the US government who first tracked down Oscar when they saw this unbelievable movement had been created against the FARC. And they were like, and all of the traditional diplomatic ways of finding who was behind this had failed and it, it literally came down to as, as being as simple as, as Jared looking on his computer, going to, logging into Facebook, looking who'd set up a million voices, oh it, it's Oscar and they, they, they then met and what was interesting about it is it's probably the, the first piece of, uh, or the first diplomatic meeting in history that happened through social media and technology but again another amazing example of, of a young person just doing unbelievable things and I think what we want to do is make sure that you know we have a very good balance in our councillors through from very old wise people yeah. to also some of the young leaders who've done some amazing things. Thank you very much David. Okay then now we can go live to Dublin and he's to one of our earliest and most passionate supporters and a delicate sponsor someone I'm very pleased to know. He's a diplomat He's an entrepreneur, he's a philanthropist, he's originally from Australia, and now, with a bit of luck, he's on the screen with us, and he's Bill Liao, and David's got a question for him. Bill, hello, and thank you for joining us. Um, the question really has, you know, obviously one of the key things behind making One Young World a success is people sponsoring delegates from countries who don't necessarily have the, the money to send delegates themselves, and I'm just interested in what is it that made you support One Young World? Well, David, I recently heard a joke. The Earth says to Venus, Oh, I'm sick. I've got a bad case of Homo sapiens. <laughs> and Venus replies, You'll be fine. I had that once. It doesn't last. <laughs> you know, Travelling the world, you get to see many things. You, know, you listen to the rhetoric of those in power, and it becomes clear that we need new ways of being and doing to meet the challenges that our species faces. So, as I'm wholly committed to having a world that works for everyone, it was kind of serendipitous, actually, to be invited to participate in One Young World and to sponsor. You know, it's been said that the future is another country, and yet we're much closer to our future than that. And we don't have another planet. It's high time, I believe, we start seeing the truth that we're all for and first and foremost of this Earth, and that we're all in this mess together, and more importantly, that we've made a mess. And, you know, young people are often discounted with some condescension in our world and in our media, and yet many I've met are accomplishing much, and our young people will all have to face the future that we've created together. And it struck me, you know, what if one thing that holds these young heroes back from the widespread impact they deserve is not having sufficient stature, stature which might mitigate condescension. After all, you know, a hero really is an ordinary person who's called to being extraordinary. And stature is something that grows in mysterious ways 
And yet there are some things we know about stature. And One Young World, I believe, provides a context that you can build stature in. You know, coming together to robustly exchange and debate methodologies and ideas for change. Spending time and being mentored, particularly by those who already possess great stature through their achievements. And spreading the word of extraordinary achievements of these young people who are committed to what they do for the world. If we can provide a runway for these young leaders of today, we may just have a future as a species. And even the chance of that was enough to draw my full support, especially as I know that everyone involved is really, you know, they're great people like Carol, absolute huge integrity and, and very noble spirit. So a bit long-winded, but that's what drew me. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you. Bill, thank you, and thank you very much for your support. You're very welcome. Well, I wasn't expecting that compliment. That's very nice to end the uh, session on. I'm now in a very jolly mood. So just to say, we've got time, 10, 15 minutes for questions from you, the audience. And if there are many, I'll take two or three at a time. If, if not, we'll go backwards and forwards, whatever comes. Ollie, sitting at the back there, is listening in to um, people who are sending in questions from, as I say, from our news reporters and colleagues around the world. And they may well, too, have questions. So anyone in the audience got questions to start with? Good. And if you could just say, so that we know, say your name, you haven't got to tell me your age, but sort of just if there's a bit of background to you that will help us, whether you're a reporter or whatever it is, it will just give us a bit of help. Thank um, you very much. Hi, my name's James. I'm a Reuters correspondent. Um, I'm particularly interested in this proportional representation that you mentioned earlier, um, why you've decided to do it like this, what are the potential pitfalls um, if there are 300 delegates from China, for example, they're going to have a lot of influence and power, um, how important is it to get every country rep with a representation? Is that realistic? Um, uh, all that sort of... Okay, is there anybody else wants to ask a question here too? I'll take another one just sort of while we're thinking. Anybody else back here? Not at the moment, you can have your think. So anyway, who wants to pick that one up? Okay, um, hello, hello then, thank you very much for being here. This, this is absolutely a complex one and I think when we first looked at it, the, the inspiration that Lucy and his, and his guys had was looking forward 10, 20 years, what will the, where, will, where will influence be? And we thought we'd try to recreate that world, hence this, these large delegations from the most populous nations. It's extremely, to your point, um, how difficult is that? What are the issues? Massive issues, absolutely massive issues. So I'll take a, a, a straightforward thing with India there, trying to put together a, dele a delegation of, of 240-odd people. Lot, a, lot, a lot of work and a, and a lot of things. What is going on there at the moment is um, Times of India, in a few weeks' time, are launching a competition backed by some of the biggest companies in India to have, uh, to, to, to have a competition for delegates for India. So that was kind of a good thing for us because we go, gee, you know, we, we, we're going to be able to solve this huge, getting this huge delegation from mm -hmm. India. China, of course, is significantly more complex. Um, through the very good offices of Carol Stone and, and June and Carol's people, we have had um, a couple of meetings with Madame the Ambassador and we are talking to Mr. Chen, who is the vice, executive vice president of the All China Youth Federation. We have a meeting this afternoon down at the Foreign Office. There are some Chinese companies and some also some very um, marvellous um, academics, Chinese academic students that are in the UK and in the USA at the moment, who of course are relatively easy to get to. I think there's a complexity beyond those big two, because China with her go-out policy, we can talk to them and they are certainly interested. I'm not saying they've committed yet, because they haven't. But I think clearly there are other countries where um, actually it's a lot more difficult and the most obvious of those would be Burma, I guess. But you might have said that a difficult one would be North Korea. But we have had extremely thus far positive engagement from the North Korean embassy here in the UK. Nothing guaranteed at the moment, but definitely an outreach. I think one of the things that has been interesting and, and very touching has been that um, we were concerned that there are many tiny, tiny nations in the world where really if you made their representation proportionate to those of China and India, they'd have a, a baby's fingernail for a delegate because the proportions are just so massive. 
But some of those tiny countries where we don't even have business ourselves and even our biggest global clients are not there, what we've been doing is running a program in London of reaching out to their embassies that are here in the UK because all of them are here. And it's been very interesting and very touching because those embassies are saying, oh, we'll send someone from an NGO in our country and we definitely want to send someone. And then you just realize quite often the little countries just get left out of this sort of thing. And yet as Kofi Annan beats David and me over the head about every day, it is many of those tiny nations that are suffering first and hardest with the coming impact of climate change. They're already losing a lot. So we, we, it's a big effort to get to them. But your question is a good one. It's a hard one to do. It's also, make, I mean, it makes our job a, a lot harder because when you actually do that, a lot of the countries where you start wanting people from, uh, are, you know, it, the easiest thing in the world would be to fill 1,500 people from the US and the UK. We'd probably have it all locked and done by next Friday. So it makes it more of a challenge, but also it's not entirely proportionally representative because um, we're going to have two representatives from every country and then from then on, it's proportionally representative. Is it realistic to have a representation from every country, or do you think it will be like I know Sub Saharan Africa wasn't on your polling? Uh... I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's absolutely realistic. Whether we end up achieving it or not, um, you know, I'll tell you on February the 8th, and we're not going to be sitting there going, we were supposed to have 22 from that country and we, had, we got 20, therefore we failed. I mean, I, I think one of the key things will be that, you know, tapping into some of the richer countries to actually fund people from some of the poorer countries. And I think that will be a, a core element of it. But it's certainly our goal. I think it's an absolutely realistic goal and we'll, we'll know in February next year whether we achieved it or not. Thank you very much and thank you, James. Now, Oli has got thing, people who are sending us questions. Yeah, I'll try the mic. Um, several questions really about uh, delegates and where they're coming from. But this one I think is quite interesting because it, it talks about our selection process as well. So this is from Nadia in, in Sky in Greece. Uh, what are the goals of this specific initiative? Do you think that there's a lack of fresh ideas in the EU? What do you answer to those accusing you of discriminating between smart and not so smart people? So what are, you, what, are you, what are your criteria of choosing members for, for One Young World? You can only answer one of those if you want to, Kate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can take the middle one about the EU. <laughs> I mean, I think our goal is really simple. It's what I, what I kind of said up front, which is, you know, what we want to do is provide a voice for the future young leaders and the future leaders of the world to actually shape the future of the world. So the conversation I had with, with Oscar was, you know, what he did was unbelievable. How much easier would it have been for him if he had a vehicle like One Young World to actually communicate through? Um, so I think that, that's our objective. I mean, I think, you know, I'd go broader than the EU. I mean, I think, you know, in the world in general, uh, people tend to feel that, you know, politicians are not necessarily representing uh, what is right for the future of the world and what is right for the people, but more what is right for their vested interest and we'll, we'll keep them in office. And I think, you know, I think there's a need and a desire for fresh ideas everywhere. And, you know, I think one of the, the great things that's happened in the last decade was the election of Obama uh, in, in the US. And I can't remember what the third question was. About the EU. Uh, like smart, smart. smart, yes. yes I mean, discrimination. I mean, the, the point is the power of one young world is really going to depend upon the, the power and capability of the people in that room to shape the future, to have an influence, uh, to, to come up with you know, powerful um, conclusions to these plenary sessions, pass powerful resolutions and make them have an impact in the world. And I think, you know, by definition, smarter people are probably more likely to get us further than if we say, you know, we're, 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 we're not necessarily you know, trying to target smart people in inverted commas. But I think it's, it's, I don't think leadership is necessarily about intelligence. Um, I think leadership is about an ability to, to motivate people, to get people to follow you, to listen to people. So I think, you know, hopefully what we will do is we'll end up with a very eclectic audience, a very multicultural audience, an audience who can make things happen. And if, you know, what their academic performance is, is, is not that important. I mean, in terms of, you know, there are some amazing 15 and 16 year olds who have done things in Africa who, you know, who haven't actually sat in a, a particularly good educational establishment. So it's certainly not about being academically smart. If I could just make one, just, and just add one thing that's sort of um, anecdotal that I think maybe the, the, the media chaps might like. 
Um, Carol and I were um, talking about One Young World at a dinner a couple of months ago, um, and and um, some UK-based media bigwigs, some very powerful people, which is potentially quite a, a cynical group of people. And sitting next to me when I was speaking was Peter Bazalgette, who is one of the founders of Endemol, who of course created and owned Big Brother. So you can take a read on, on where you go for cynicism with that. And I was quite scared because I thought he'd be sitting there going, oh, you know, and being really cynical. And in the discussion after my talk, um, we had a lot of questions and some of them were negative. Peter, whom I didn't know previously, suddenly most woke up and looked around the dinner and said, you know what, 1,500 people, if they even get it half right, there are going to be 10 future world leaders in the room I'm in, I'm sponsoring someone, which was just a real, you know, a tremendous leap, I thought, of faith in a way from Peter, but also the vision to say, as David says, whether you characterize them as smart or not, among this group in London in February, there will be future world leaders. The question for us and our age group is, how do we help them? Well, we've only got 10 minutes left. First of all, Sally Hudson's in the room, who works very closely with the work that Bill does. Anything you want to say, Sally? Um, just that it's really... Sorry, thank you. Not really a question, just to say what an honour it is to be here today and to be part of um, One Young World. And just, I hope that this goes on and on and on. Thank you oh. very much. And Oliver Rowe, who has did the analysis of research, nothing particularly you want to pick up on. You're there if we need you afterwards. That's like anyone in the room that's got another question here. Upward, a man behind us. Who are you? Where'd you come from? How old are you? Are you single? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Michael Green from the Philanthro Capitalism blog. Um, David, you talked about a Davos for 25-year-olds. Now, Davos itself fuels lots of conspiracy theories and questions about legitimacy. Um, how would you answer that question about, you know, you're a company, you're setting an agenda, you're selecting participants. What's the legitimacy of this gathering? Um, I, I mean, I, I make two comments. I think, you know, one of the things that I think is, is missing at Davos, which I hope we'll have in spades at this, is... Um, Kind of the people who go to Davos have sort of all made it, um, and therefore I think that tends it tends to be quite conformist. You know, you rarely sit watching a panel and have a, a tough question asked, or it tends to be kind of it tends. And I think what we need is a hell of a lot of challenging, and that's I think the goal behind the youth here. The second thing is an enormous amount of the participation is going to be young people voting, which young people go. So I think the less the less of a role we play in selecting who comes and the more of a role, for example, the, the YouTube competition being one example of it, is that you know, you, young people are voting on who it is that they think should be attending, then the, the, the better the outcome and, and the better the event will be. Thank you. I think, I think the other point on authenticity with the councillors as well, and you would know this, Michael, I mean, we've got some of the great and the good there and some of the people certainly I think all of us most admire. And you know when you're setting up a conference for authenticity, um, all of these people have charities and charitable interests and foundations. And if you pay a lot of money, a million dollars, you get Bill Clinton, don't you? We're not paying these guys. Yeah, we had to convince these guys of the authenticity. And I, I do think their moral stature does speak for us and for the youngsters. Ah. No, first that. No, no. Red. No, no. <laughs> okay. Red then purple. So I'm da Claire Foster from a very new charity called the Ethics Academy, oh, which is yes, interested welcome. in creating heroes for the 21st century. And we, we've got a program that, that it's, a, it's an educational program. And my question for you is, uh, because this was my experience growing up as a kid who wanted to set the world on fire and change everything, that I became really seriously disillusioned by summits and plenary sessions with conclusions that went to, you know, people passed resolutions. And it seemed to me that that wasn't what was going to change the zeitgeist. Something else was. It was something to do with how the mind of the world is changed. And I'm, I, I would so hate these 25-year-olds to become disillusioned following this. How are you going to be really sure? I suppose there are two things, really. One is that, OK, so the UN resolution passed. Is that going to change the world? And how are you going to persuade these youngsters that they didn't waste their time, number one? Because they don't trust world leaders. That's what your research showed. 
uh, political leaders. And number two, those um, creating those leaders for the 21st century. It's not just, uh, I mean, you have to create them. They don't just happen. They need help. They need mentoring. And is there some thought about that in terms of fashioning the, the, the talent, the skills? So. Help cope on to that and let's go to the lady behind you. Hi, my name's Jo. Um, I'm on the uh, blogger advisory for One Young World, um, on global business mainly. Um, uh, when I'm not blogging, I work for a consultancy called Africa Practice. And my question, which was picked up on by the gentleman over there actually, was um, why wasn't there any respondents from sub-Saharan Africa in, uh, in the research? Because there's lots of people with lots of uh, things to say there. Okay, then thank you very Should much. Should I have a go at the first one and you have a go at the you'll, second you'll one? You'll pick up on Claire's. Okay, what, both her points? Uh, well, I'll kind of try. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I think the, the, for me, the big, big difference, I hope, is the power of the internet, digital media, and social networking to make this a, have an impact that it, the same event 10 years ago, it, it couldn't have had that, you know. I mean, I think one of the things that happens in the world today is it's great that there's lots of people in the room, but actually, you know, there's a ton of people who aren't in the room today from all over the world, and actually, hopefully, an outreach which is even greater than that. So I think, you know, of course, we can't guarantee what's going to happen. I think if, if basically a whole bunch of stuff happens and the people who came are, are really cynical and, and think, actually, that was a, a complete wasted trip, and no impact is felt, then I think what we'll, we will conclude is there won't be a One Young World in 2011. Um, I, I think from the reaction I've seen and the kind of people already who are getting involved, I mean, I just think there's a level of an excitement and interest around this, which is amazing. I, you know, of all the things we've ever been involved in, I've ever been involved in, I've, no one has actually gone, wow, that's a really crap idea, why are you doing it? You know, the, just the level of interest from everybody is, is amazingly high. And I think, I think, you know, people and the Oscar example um, is a great one. I mean, here's, you know, here's a guy who, through no help, managed to basically get 12 million people marching around the world. So if we can even have a little bit of that, it will have been a, a, a massive success. And I think the whole follow-up and mentoring is, is really, really key. I'm a, I'm a member of the Young Global Leaders from the World Economic Forum, and I think there's a, a really interesting uh, model in place there to, to have, uh, you know, communities and follow-up and, and action and, and key agenda items, and I think our, our goal is to do exactly that. What we need to do is lock and load the first one, make it happen, and make it a success. Okay, do you want to add anything? It was really, your question was more or less similar to you've already answered, wasn't it, Joe's question? The Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, yeah. which is a very good going, question and a very good point. I was going to Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, as Kofi Annan always says to me when he sees me, hello, my fellow African, and I know Kofi will break my legs about that polling. Reality was that was phase two polling. We did phase one was a 1,200-person pilot. Phase two is, is part of the piloting of the next. And we got nowhere with the polling with Sub-Saharan Africa, which shows there's a lot of work to be done with that. So what will happen now with phase three? We won't just be sitting there and hoping that it comes in online. We have a serious program in place, obviously from the country from which I come, to help us across Sub-Saharan Africa. But what we're definitely having to do is work on polling through schools so that people can come into schools to use computers and have a commentary. But Kofi Annan's Youth Forum and his Global Humanitarian Forum are helping us with that. But absolutely fair cop. The other one is, of course, in Latin America. We only had Mexico. Thank you very much. We've only got a few minutes left. And I don't want to keep you. Stay on afterwards for a drink and talk to anybody. But I just first want to go to Ollie. And I see a hand there. So an Ollie and a hand here, then we'll wrap up. Ollie. Well, just one about uh, some of. Uh, our ground uh, work here, and this is from Mumbai, uh, Rachita, and it's, are you planning to conduct any ground events in India to promote One Young World? I would very much like to, and all I can answer to that is we will do everything we can with the help of our office there, our CEO, Sriman Srivastava, and also with Baskar Das, who's the executive president of Times Group of India. So, yes, we will be doing everything we, we humanly can. Last question. Hi, Benedict Pavio, half French, uh, half British, um, working for a global channel. I used to work for the BBC for 12 years. I'm the UK correspondent for France 24. I broadcast in French and English around the world. And I think this is an interesting initiative. 
What is, we've heard about the really positive things. What is the most frustrating, honestly? Because I think honesty, as we've mentioned integrity, will be a really important thing. So what's the most frustrating thing that you've encountered, honestly? And um, <laughs> what about, one, though, because this is something that we need to know about. If you're gonna have a dialogue of honesty, it's about getting the right people in the room. The fact of possibly getting leaders in the room, I think, is a really challenging thing. So obviously, getting the now phase, getting them in the room, and then the mentoring that you were mentioning, I see as two absolutely crucial things. But honesty, everything is great, and it's a great initiative, but what's the most frustrating? Where are the blocks? I mean, I think the very simple, most frustrating thing is the global recession. At a full stop. I mean, I think one of the, this is a, a not-for-profit. Um, the, the challenge is that, you know, if you were to pick the timing to launch an event like this, you wouldn't pick to launch it in the middle of the biggest recession to hit the planet. So that's very, you know, that's very simply the most frustrating thing, which is why we're, we're having, you know, I think if we'd done this two years ago, um, we'd have kind of had the sponsorship done and dusted and we'd be sitting on a beach by now. Um, but so, so that's probably been the biggest challenge. I mean, I, I, I genuinely am not worried about will we get the right candidates, will the debate be interesting. I mean, you get, you get 1,500 smart young people in the room who want to attend this. It's going to be really, really interesting. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the challenge has been the recession, and, and I think we're probably, you know, that's why we, we've moved slower than we would hope. But I think the, the flip side of that has been almost, uh, I, I guess, probably the traditional way of doing this is to say, you know, we need X million, we'll go and get, you know, that, you know, we'll get three massive sponsors who write a big check, uh, job done. What's actually interesting, and part driven by uh, the recession and part driven by us wanting to do things in a more almost digitally democratic way is the number of people getting on board and, and doing, you know, sponsoring 10 people, two people, five people, 20 people. So in terms of, you know, the, the number of people committed to date, it, it, it's been built rather than someone coming along with one big check. It's been built through a huge amount of grassroots and, and quite big companies, but sponsoring, you know, 10 or 15 people. And I think what that's done is it's, it, it will make it a much more interesting and democratic sort of uh, process and movement. And then Kate's going to answer your second question. <laughs> no, I just I would just say definitely on the on, on the issue of frustration, um, the thing that that makes this sort of thing tough is really my in my age group. It's the easiest thing in the world for me to say, hey, what the hell, don't need it. Um, the sponsorship thing, as David said, is 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 yes, has to be tough in these times, but. The cynicism is tough, and there are definitely have been times when you look and you go, well, never mind about young people, I'll just look after myself. But the truth, the honest truth is, every single time you feel like that, something stuns you. Every day, there's a young person who calls and says, I want to come, I've been raising the money myself. Every day, there's a Bill Lau turning around the corner and saying, I think this is incredible, I put my own money on the table. Why? I never knew who Bill even was. Why? You know, it's not even a relationship there. Um, and then there's a wonderful day when you get an email like the email that we got from Oscar Morales and I, I just cry for an hour and think <laughs> I'm not going to be frustrated and I'm not going to be cynical and I'm going to pick myself up and keep going. And I think what, what gets over the frustration is just constantly saying the world matters and these young people matter. And, and really, really, to counter the frustration, David has lots of children. I have a child, and I think is, that's where we're at. It's for the children. Thank you. What a lovely way to end. I think there can be no doubt of the sincerity and the enthusiasm and the passion from Kate and from David and from my experience and the whole team of One Young World. Um, I think it's been, I've learned a lot today, albeit I'm a counsellor, I've learned a lot from what's been said. I'm just frustrated. There's so many of your interesting faces in the room, many of you very, very young, and I want to go around you all and say, who are you, where do you come from, what are you here for, and what do you want? <laughs> I know we can't, but there is a drink afterwards for half an hour. Do come and, and have a drink with us in the next room, talk to us or whatever. I want to thank all the team, technical, who made it all happen. Yes, I want to thank the yeah. team behind the scenes. I want to thank Chris, who, like us, got up out of his bed because for some reason we hadn't booked him in time and came up from Kent. Thank you very much, our <laughs> lovely photographer. And I want to thank you all for coming and uh, join us for a drink, please. Thank you. Well done. Who's going to